Okay, so we're back again for another reading of uh, Royal on Few Saved, his article uh, called Few Saved. We have so far read the first uh, three parts, which is what it is to be saved, and then secondly, uh, common mistakes about the number of the saved, and thirdly, what the Bible says about the number of the saved. Now we come to the fourth part, and we're only going to read um, a section of the fourth part, which is some plain facts about the number of the saved. So we'll probably bre break this section up into three um, because of the size of this uh, of this part. So reading from page 75 of his book. Uh, Let me show in the last place some plain facts about the number of the saved. I ask particular attention at this point uh, or to this point of the subject, I know well that people flatter themselves that the world is far better and wiser than it was 1800 years ago. We have churches and schools and books. We have civilization and liberty and good laws. We have a far higher standard of morality and society than that which once prevailed. We have the power of obtaining comforts and enjoyments which our forefathers knew nothing of. Steam and gas and electricity and chemistry have effected wonders for us. All this is perfectly true. I see it, and I am thankful. But all this does not diminish the importance of the question. Are there few or many of us likely to be saved? I am truly satisfied that the importance of this question is painfully overlooked. I am persuaded that the views of most people about the quantity of unbelief and sin in the world are utterly inadequate and incorrect. I am convinced that very few people, whether ministers or private Christians, at all realize how few there are in the way to be saved. I want to draw attention to the subject before I bring forward a few plain facts about it. But where shall I go for these facts? I might easily turn to the millions of heathen who in various parts of the world are worshipping they know not what. But I shall not do so. I might easily turn to the millions of Mohammedans who honour the Quran more than the Bible and the false prophet of Mecca more than Christ. So I might easily turn to the millions of Roman Catholics who are making the word of God of none effect by their traditions. But I shall not do so. I shall look nearer home. I shall draw my facts from the land in which I live and then ask every honest reader whether it be not strictly true that few are saved. I invite any intelligent reader of these pages to imagine himself in any parish in Protestant England or Scotland at this day. Choose which you please, a town parish or a country parish, a great parish or a small. Let us take our needs in our hands. Let us sift the Christianity of the inhabitants of this parish, family by family and man by man. Let us put on one side anyone who does not possess the New Testament evidence of being a true Christian. Let us deal honestly and fairly in the investigation and not allow anyone to be a true Christian who does not come up to the New Testament standard of faith and practice. Let us count every man a saved soul in whom we see something of Christ, some evidence of true repentance, some evidence of saving faith in Jesus, some evidence of real evangelical holiness. Let us reject every man in whom on the most charitable construction these evidences as one weighed in the balances and found wanting. Let us apply this sifting process to any parish in this land and see what the result would be. A. Let us decide, first of all, those persons in a parish who are living in any kind of open sin. By these I mean such as fornicators, adulterers, liars, thieves, drunkards, and cheats, revilers, and extortioners. About these, I think, there can be no difference of opinion. The Bible says plainly that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, will these persons be saved? The answer is clear to my own mind. In their present condition, they will not. B. Let us set aside in the next place those persons who are Sabbath breakers. I mean by this expression those who seldom or never go to a place of worship, though they have the power, those who do not give the Sabbath to God, but to themselves, 
those who think nothing but doing their own ways and finding their own pleasure upon Sundays. They show plainly that they are not meet or suitable for heaven. The inhabitants of heaven would be company they could not like. The employments of heaven would be a weariness to them and not a joy. Now will these persons be saved? The answer is clear to my mind. In their present condition, they will not. Let us set aside in the next place all those who are careless and thoughtless Christians. I mean by this expression those who attend many of the outward ordinances of religion but show no signs of taking any real interest in its doctrines and substance. They care little whether the minister preaches the gospel or not. They care little whether they hear a good sermon or not. They would care little if all the Bibles in the world were burned. They would care little if an act of parliament were passed, forbidding anyone to pray. In short, religion is not the one thing needful with them. Their treasure is on earth. They are just like uh, Gallio, to whom it mattered little whether people were Jews or Christians. He cared for none of these things. Now will these persons be saved? The answer is clear to my own mind. In their present condition, they will not. Let us set aside in the next place all those who are formalists and self-righteous. I mean by this expression those who value themselves on their own regularity in the use of the forms of Christianity and depend either directly or indirectly on their own doings for their acceptance with God. I mean all who rest their souls on any work but the work of Christ or any righteousness but the righteousness of Christ. Of such the apostle has expressed has expressly testified by the deeds of the law shall no flesh living be justified. But their foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And dare say we and dare we say in the face of such texts that such as these will be saved. The answer is plain to my own mind, in their present condition they will not. Let us set aside in the next place all those who know the gospel with their heads, but do not obey it with their hearts. These are those unhappy persons who have eyes to see the way of life, but have not the will or courage to walk in it. They approve sound doctrine. They will not listen to preaching which does not contain it. But the fear of man, or the cares of the world, or the love of money, or the dread of offending relations perpetually holds them back. They will not come out boldly and take up the cross and confess Christ before So the Bible speaks expressly, Faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. If any man is ashamed of me, and of my words of him, will the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory, and in his Father's, and of the holy angels? Shall we say that such as these will be saved? The answer is clear to my own mind. In their present condition, they will not. Let us set aside in the last place all those who are hypocritical professors. Expression, all those whose religion consists in and in nothing besides. These are they of whom the prophet Ezekiel speaks, uh, saying, With their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. Mm. They have a form of godliness, but they have not the power of it. They are saints at church and saints to talk to in public, but they are not saints in private and in their own homes. And worst of all, they are not saints in heart. There can be no dispute about such persons. Shall we say that they will be saved? There can be only be one answer in their present condition they will not and now after setting aside these classes which i have described i ask any sensible thinking reader to tell me how many persons in any parish in england will there be left behind how many after sifting a parish truly and honestly how many men and women will remain who are in the way to be saved how many true penitents how many real believers in christ how many truly holy people will there be found? I put it to the conscience of every reader of this volume to give me an honest answer, as in the sight of God. 
I ask you whether after sifting a parish with the Bible in the fashion described, you can come to any conclusion but this, that few persons, sadly few persons, are in the way to be saved. It is a painful conclusion to arrive at, but I know not how it can be avoided. It is a fearful and tremendous thought that there should be so many churchmen in England and so many dissenters, so many seat holders and so many pew renters, so many hearers and so many communicants, and yet, after all, so few in a way to be saved. But the only question is, is it not true? It is vain to shut our eyes against facts. It is useless to pretend not to see what is going on around us. The statements of the Bible and the facts of the world we live in will lead us to the same conclusion. Many are being lost and few being saved. And we'll leave the reading at that for the moment. We'll just have a brief word of prayer. Father, we do pray for we pray for uh, the situation that we are in and we pray lord that many would come to genuine faith and trust in the lord jesus christ forgive us for our sins forgive us lord for not walking in thy ways and according to thy word and bless us this night lord may many be truly saved uh, who have not even considered these things in the days ahead. Help us, O oh God, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.